prayer request. Sister Tammy. My dad and my family and uh, Sammy, the little girl I had, her real daddy is going Thursday for DNA testing and he wants us to pray that everything works out fine so he'll get full custody of her. All right. Anyone else? Sister, Sister Bula and the Darren. And Brother Darren are both sick. The doctor, Sister Janine. And let's keep thinking of these souls after you go out and compel them to come in that God house may be full. Yes. That's right. Ron? For our family and extended family in the Philippines and the, state, and the states and the church families here, also for the prayers in the prayer box, um, and also for all the people that have been passing cards out to us. I've been getting good uh, reports from every last one, and the one I talked to today when, before I came home, when I got my meal, she said, uh, she said, this is the second time you come in here and you, you invite me. She said, it must be, God must be speaking uh, through you to me. She said, because my, I, I've been praying and asking for me and my little girl a good church to, to come to. All right. And she, and she says, uh, where are y'all at? She said, I ain't got a car, but she says, I'm in the process of getting a second one. She said, so it was once I did it. She said, I can't come this weekend because I got to work here. But she said, maybe next weekend I can do it. All right. And there's multitudes out there just like this. I met a lady at Victor's Saint scenario looking for a church. I'm telling you, they're out there. They're looking for it. They're, they just don't know we're here. And that's, a, that's an embarrassment, really, for the church. But we need to, this is another purpose, this is to make our presence known. Sister Norma. I have a first cousin that uh, had a stroke, and they found out that he had colon cancer. Oh, and, and they did surgery twice, and he's just there. So I'm asking the church to keep him lifted in prayer. Yes. All right, remember that, Brother Don. I can get him there after the prayer for a Sunday. Remember, Curtis yes. beat off, same young man. Okay, so please, let's continue to pray for him. Anyone else but Sister Janine? Salvation from Arizona. Salvation. That, that, that's more important than a main count. Yes, it is. Really, truly. It's, it's the most important thing in the world, and the hour that we're living in is people to be ready Amen. to be in God. Because we know from the word of the Lord that the Bible says even now, hell enlarges. There's construction going on in hell to receive a multitude of people that's going to go there. And everyone that you reach is one soul that you can pluck from the flames of hell. Please, this, this is a very serious and urgent thing. Yes, sir. It's not just numbers. Numbers, if the, the numbers are on the pew, that means people are having an opportunity to hear the Word of God. Amen. That's why the numbers, when I say there's 3,500, that's what I ask God for. I believe that there are people out there, just like Brother Ron spoke of, the lady I met at Victor's Cafeteria. There's people out there that are praying even now and searching They're for a place that they can attend church. Yes. Please, let's continue. So good to see our friends tonight. And yes. we brought us a, a bunch of Bibles that we're going to be able to use for gifts. And, and yes. his wife, I'm sorry, I, I keep just calling my friends. What's the last name again? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And your name is Brent. 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 I, I can remember Brent. I got a cousin named Brent. <laughs> we're so glad to have Brenda. Hallelujah. Your first name is David. 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 I can already be able to remember that now. I'll just associate you with David the psalmist. Amen. Amen. We're glad David and Brenda are here. Hallelujah. Amen. And God is blessing. God is so good. Anyone else with a prayer request, maybe an unspoken, just of a private nature, all right, hands all over the building. Let's take these to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we love you tonight. I have faith. We realize, God, that this is an urgent hour that we're living in. You said in the Lord that there will be perilous times, and truly, we're living in that hour. Lord, but the church needs to be strong. For you said they that know their God shall be strong and do hate for us. And we're believing you tonight, God, that you're going to bless us. Lord, bless the offers of Snowy God. Keep your hands upon them. God, they're, they're vessels also, Lord, and they're helping them. They 
David and pray the Lord and Lord, help us round up some Bibles. God, we're thanking you for sending them our way. We love them and appreciate them. I pray, God, every person that this prayer was made for, you see, Sister Marie Latine's dad. God, I ask you to touch that man's body one more time. Let the healing balm of Gilead flow into his body. Lord, let them find a blood pressure. And God, let that blood pressure begin to come up. We're trusting you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody say amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, we're so glad you're here. Good to see my friend back here. It's so good to see her. She's visiting with us tonight, but and, and I was telling her next week, I, I was going to start it this week, but I kind of wanted to focus, continue to focus just a little bit on this evangelism, this outreach. I've got some letters here that uh, we're going to assign some, some people to different sections of town. And we're going to work this. Yes. Amen. That's right. We're going to do it. Amen. I had an old boss one time. He says, the lies of plan. Stick to the plan and work the plan. And he said it equals success. And I believe that law of my heart. We're going to seek the face of God. Yes. But tonight, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. Somebody texts me today and says, you say this all the time. But today I became convinced, and I don't know what, what they've really been believing before this, but they said we have become convinced that obedience Yes. It's the only way that Amen. you can live for God. Amen. Amen. I said, well, that's true. I, I teach that all the time. It was disobedience that got Adam and Eve cast from the Garden of Eden. It was disobedience during the dispensation of Noah with Noah's ark. It was disobedience. People walked in, no doubt, and looked at the ark. We had the privilege of a year or so ago, two years ago, we went to the Ark in Kentucky. It's the replica that they built. And I don't remember exactly what it's called other than the Ark, but the Ark Encounter. Ark Encounter. That's what it was. And we went there and I knew the Ark was big and this Ark is supposed to be built to the same measurements and that, that comes from the Word of God. And as I walked through that ark and looked at that mass structure, and I could almost imagine people coming to the ark and, and looking around, and, and they thought it was wonderful, and they, they thought that this is a great thing, but the Bible says they walked and made fun and said, well, where are you going to float it? If God gives you instructions to do something, That's right. whether the all everything is there that's needed or not, if you will be obedient to yes. God, God brought the water to Noah's heart. He did. And he flooded that the whole earth and it covered even the highest mountaintops. And, and I began to study on the, some of the highest mountains and and yet there was water that there was no dry land, the Bible says. Right. And obedience is everything. Yes. I don't always, and I tell God that all the time, because I don't always really understand some of the things that God reveals to me. I ask for revelation. God, I need to understand what you're trying to show me. And I said, God, I'm not real smart, so get it right down on a kid's level so I can make sure I don't miss what you're trying to teach. I really do, because we have to understand God said if any man lack understanding, let him want. Just ask. I told someone today, or just this evening, I said, there is no dumb or stupid questions. The only one that's dumb and stupid is the one that you don't ask. 
If you don't understand something, yes. ask. Mm -hmm. I, I try when I teach Bible studies, I try never, ever to teach over 45 minutes because the human mind can only consume so much and when you're right. teaching the Word of God. Sometimes in 20 minutes, you almost you've lost people because they don't understand and, and what you're teaching from the Word of God is contrary to what they've been taught all of their lives. I talked to a young man I was working a little bit at Sister Daisy's, Sister Vicky's place today trying to finish up some flooring and you know, I heard somebody a just a knock. First thing it sounded like it was a woodpecker. <laughs> I went and I looked at the door and didn't see anybody and it started the knock started again and finally he, he came in and he said what are you doing? <laughs> I got a nail bag on I got a hammer in my hand I got a skill saw in my hand and he wants to know what I'm doing and I said well I'm just trying to put a little flooring down and I asked him I said where do you go to church? Why are you asking me about church? I just stopped by to see what you was doing. I said, well, I'm a preacher. And he went, uh-oh. <laughs> I grabbed one of my cards in my pocket. I said, here, man. I said, you don't go to church? Not really. He never got time for that. I said, well, soon you wish you had time. I said, you need to understand. And, and I gave him a little card. And I said, I want you to come. And he said, well, I might have been ain't raining because I ride a bicycle. I said, well, if it's raining, there's a number on the card. You call me, and I'll come get you. I said, is that fair enough? Well, he, he said, well, thanks for all the information. And out the door he went. <laughs> and I knew he didn't go to church anywhere when I told him I was a preacher. Because he went, uh-oh. <laughs> but he's not the only one. That's the truth. There are thousands of people mm -hmm. out there. Walk in the street. Let's read Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived, and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Be a boy, okay? Verse 2. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep. But Cain was a tiller of the ground. Verse 3. And in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground and offered unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But notice what God did about Cain. But unto Cain and to his offering. He had much respect, and Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. Cain got mad because God says, This is not the way you that I want to sacrifice. People sometimes get upset when you show them from the Word of God, and what you're showing them is contrary, I said it, to what they believe. Amen. And sometimes, I don't want to hear this. Yep. Wow. And a lady a few days ago was trying to witness to her. She was asking all the questions, and I was just trying to give some answers. And finally, she said, don't tell me no more. If I don't know anymore, I'm not accountable. And if I'm not accountable, then I'm okay. I said, we've been talking 10 minutes. You already know too much. Every answer I gave you was concerning your salvation. Well, I noticed that. I said, but you just kept asking questions. So I just kept going in that same vein. And that's when she said, don't tell me no more. Abel brought the firstlings of his flock. Right. Cain brought his first tomatoes and cucumbers and cantaloupes and put it on an altar and God rejected Cain's sacrifice. Why? 
because it wasn't because there was no blood. blood. There was no blood. The Bible says, the scripture we just read, and Cain was wrong, mad, and his countenance fell. And in verse 6, the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wrong? Why are you angry? God was asking him, What made you so mad? Your mom and daddy taught you from birth that the sacrifice had to be a blood sacrifice. You disobeyed what you were taught. Why are you so mad? Yes. The way you said it, you could have done something from his brother. He could have sold some of his vegetables, bought him a lamb, bought him a turtle dove, bought him a bullock, and God would have been fine with it. But Cain decided, I'm going to do it my way. And God's going to have to take it. And God's just going to have to accept that. This is what I've got, and this is what I'm going to give. And when God rejected his sacrifice, Cain got mad and his whole countenance failed. Genesis chapter 4 verse 7 says, If thou doest well, shall I not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, what? Sin. Sin lies at the door because James 4 17 says, If I know to do good and I do it not, then to me it is sin. sin. If I know what God requires of me, the death, the burial, and the resurrection, repentance, baptism, and the filling of the Holy Ghost, if I know that's what God requires right. of me, and I try to do it another way and say, well, God, you're just going to have to accept this way, you are in trouble Amen. with God. Amen. Same as Cain was. Same as Cain was. He said, If thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. In Genesis 4 and 8, And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. Do you see the progression of sin? Did anybody ever tell a lie and say, well, it was just a little white lie? There is no little white lie or little black lie or little red lie or little green lie. There is no. Come on, a lie is a lie. And in Revelations, John the Revelator said, shall have their part in the lake of fire. Why? Because lying is sin. Scripture says it is impossible for God to lie. Sin is sin. It only takes one killing to make you a murderer. That's a fact. It only takes picking up something that doesn't belong to you that makes you a thief. Please understand this. Obedience is everything. Yes, it is key. If I know that God expects me, and He does, He says, go into the highways and the byways and compel them to come in, that my house may be full. If we don't go and do what God asks us to do, then we're disobedient. We really are. In this story, we have two brothers. Each brother was born after Adam and Eve left the Garden of Eden. And after God laid them, told them that the ground would be cursed. Because in Genesis 3 and 17, it was cursed. Why? Because of Adam and Eve's disobedience. God drove them from the garden. And he said, man, you're going to make your living by the sweat of your brow. 
Woman, you're going to bear children. And have pain. And, and you're going to have pain like you have never... I, I've been at the hospital, and I get down as far as I can hear a lady in childbirth screaming. Our last one was born really wrong, was too big. And the doctor said, I made a mistake. I should have done this baby cesarean section, but it's too late now. And Sister Perkins was screaming because she's only five foot tall and there's not a lot of room there for a nine pound, six ounce baby. <laughs> and she was screaming and I couldn't take it no more. And I stepped outside of the, the room where she was at and the doctor come marching down the hall and he said, you've got to tell her to be quiet. There's other women back here having babies. I said, yeah, they're all screaming. They're all doing it. Well, you're her husband. I said, you want to tell her to shut up? You go do it. That's right. He walked in there and I mean, she was wringing wet. That's right. And he said, no, Linda, you're going to have to quiet down. And she grabbed him by his coat. <laughs> and she pulled him right down where his nose was touching her. She said, you get on this table and lay in labor for six hours and see how you feel. Right. <laughs> he turned and walked out. I followed him. I said, boy, no, you really told her. He said, you can't deal with a woman in, in labor. I said, but you wanted me to go do that. I said, she just grabbed your coat, pulled it down to where y'all were nose to nose. I said, if I'd have done that, I said, I'd have brought it on the floor. <laughs> Genesis 3 and 17. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, I commanded you not to do it. Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed. cursed is the ground for thy sake. The reason the ground will be cursed is because of your disobedience. People all the time, it just nothing seems to ever go right. It could be because of sin. It's lying in your door. We've got to get to a place where we can truly repent and when we repent repentance means turning and walking away from what you just asked God to forgive you it does not mean God I'm sorry I did it and tomorrow I'm going right back and doing it again that was not repentance it wasn't Adam and Eve are driven into the land east of Eden to struggle to survive they had everything that they would ever want or need in the garden. But they had nothing but thorns and thistles. And into this vast ocean of despair, they find hope. Because Eve was pregnant. In all the time that they spent in the garden, this had never happened. My Lord. Because they knew nothing about sin and their eyes had not been opened to worry. They could see the difference in the male and the female. The first command that God gave to creation is be fruitful and, and multiply. In Genesis 1 and 28, You'll put that up there real quickly. I don't think I gave you that. I'll get it. Just type it in real quick. I just want us to see what the Word of God is trying to get us to understand. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air. And over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. All right. So we see here that God told them, I want you to be fruitful and multiply. Throughout their time in the garden, they never had a son. But when they leave the garden, Eve becomes pregnant. This was obviously a very joyous occasion for the couple. Because they give their firstborn the name Cain. The word Hue 
Arcadian in the Greek, arcane, means acquisition. In Hebrew, that's why it says in Genesis chapter 4 verse 1, I have gotten a man from the Lord. It sounds, if you just read it at face A, it seems like she went and just purchased her a son. Right. That's what that word Cain means, a acquisition or a requisition. Adam and Eve felt that they had their first success in life without the protection of the garden. In Genesis 3 and 17, we looked at that, but I want to go back one more time. Genesis 3 and 17. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and the sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. The land is going to be cursed. <coughs> wow. But Eve is not. My mind. Who was the first for taking the fruit? Eve. The woman. Eve did. And because Adam had no backbone, Adam had no authority in, in his own life, when Eve offered it to him, he could have told her, what are you doing? God said we cannot eat of that no. But instead, she turned around and headed to Adam, and what did he do? He took a bite. <laughs> it was a weak vessel. <laughs> I don't know what God would have done. That's a good question. He said, what would have happened if Adam had not ate it? That's the truth. That's a good question. But Eve, the land was cursed, but Eve wasn't. Mine. Now they had created something no one had ever before produced life except God. That's the truth. This was literally the coolest thing that anyone had ever done. That's why it's not surprising that they gave him the name acquisition or wealth. If he were alive today, we would call him Mr. Marvelous. That's the truth. Or Captain Incredible. Mr. Wonder of Wonders. Adam and Eve poured all their hopes and expectations into Cain. That's true. He was amazing, incredible, a wonder to behold. Matter of fact, look at what we have done, Adam and Eve said. That's true. We have created life. We have to look deeper into this to understand what the Lord's talking about. The Lord Jesus. Bible says that Joshua had a better spirit. I want to look at the spirit of Cain tonight to help us understand how important it is that we get involved in this. This evangelism. Yes, Lord. To have the spirit of Cain is to consider your own needs and wants ahead of others. Uh -huh. That's true. That's true. That's what Cain's spirit did. He only looked out for number one. Yes, sir. That's Why a fact. Else? People with this spirit are more concerned with what they can get from people than what they can do for people. Ain't that the truth? <laughs> They just look out for number one, themselves. <coughs> That's the spirit of Cain. <coughs> Jude, verse 11, and I didn't give you that, I'll just read it, but it says, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. My God. Go ahead and put it up there, the 11th verse of Jude. There's only one chapter. And they have ran greedily after the era of Balaam's reward. What was Balaam's reward? When the king called for Balaam called to come God. and to curse God's the Hebrew people. He couldn't curse them. God spoke to 
That woman says, what I have blessed. You can't curse it. No man can curse. That's it. But Balaam should have stopped right then and said, no king, I can't do it. But he kept looking over the in the back of the king and saw this big old chest of gold and silver. And he began to try to figure a way how I can get this That's true. and not make God mad. <coughs> My God. Jude verse 11. Let's read it. Woe to them that go all the way of pain and ran greedily after the arrow and the war. war. And did what? Perish. In the game saying of Korah. Everybody knows who Korah is? Yes. Yeah. So oh, yes. There was David and a buyer and Korah and they go around the Israelite camp. They were Egyptians. Yes. And they just came along because they saw the mighty manifestation of God's power. And they said, we're going to follow along with these people because they, they tapped in. They've got something. But at night, Brother Bobby, when the camp was resting, they'd go around and try to stir up some confusion. That's it. Wow. You know that guy we followed, Moses? He's been up here for 40 days. Uh -huh. We ain't even heard from him. He's probably dead. We need to pick up camp and keep moving. Always trying to start confusion. That's why he said, perish in the gates of God. Corbin. Balaam is the one who took money to curse the Israelites. Yes, sir. When they were in the desert after leaving Egypt, and even though the Bible says that he did not issue a curse, the idea that someone in the ministry would be in it just for the money is a spirit of Cain. Amen. That's right. My Lord, a mercenary. It is. The Bible calls them hirelings. That's mercenary. Eight or years ago, I was only 20, I guess I was about 20. And I told him what I was feeling. I told him, I said, when we was at camp this year, I said, I said, what do you recommend, Brother Ebear? Run! I said, run, boy. Run just as hard as you can. Don't stop. You should be. I thought he was mad at me, so I just walked away. <laughs> Every time I'd see him outside, I'd just kind of duck, you know. Just... <laughs> Finally, one day he was sitting on the porch, and I went and sat down with him. I said, Brother Harry, are you mad at me? <laughs> I said, Why did you scream? Run! <laughs> he said, Because if you can outrun the call of God, you'll be thousands of times better. He said, if you can't outrun the call, he said, you better count the cost. It'll be great. He said, you better make sure that it's the call of God on you and that the burden of God is going to call. That's it. Because he said, if not, he said, you're going to live a miserable life. It's a heavy load to carry. I said, oh, that's a weird name for a preacher to take. It's a very heavy load to carry. So I went back up home to church and I went in and I asked Brother Cooper, I said, can I talk to you? He said, yeah. So way before church, I got there early and we got in his office. And I was telling him what I was feeling. I said, what do you recommend, Brother Cooper? Run! <laughs> <laughs> Because you know, I figured that scripture out of the mouth of two or three witnesses let it be established. And I ran. <laughs> and I ran, and the more I ran, the more miserable I got. I couldn't get away from that calling. Right. Could not run it. So I went to a young minister seminar at the campground, and Brother Teddy was teaching. <laughs> Recommendations, Brother Kenny. Run! <laughs> I said, oh my God. 
<laughs> oh, we got a preacher the other day. He says, what do y'all do? Just play golf and eat fried chicken? And... I said, somebody has misinformed you. Far That's from right. it. That's it. Many times at 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning, my phone rings and I get up and I go meet people at the hospital. Uh-huh. Like Booger. I have people call and they don't, they don't even come to church here. My phone will ring and we know we don't attend your church, but we know when you pray. We know God, listen, would you come God. pray for our people? Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Mm -hmm. I went to Tulane University and prayed for a man from New Iberia. His sister called. She said, he's dying. There's no way he can live. And would you come? And I went and prayed with him. And he was a backslider. A man away from God. Oh my God, Jesus. And when I walked in, he was so weak, he could hardly talk. And I, I get my ear right now next to him. And he talked to me. And he said, I'm dying. And I'm lost. God. That's why I asked my sister oh to get you to come God. pray. I said, we're going to anoint you with all the doctors. Well, I'm going to step out. I said, well, you don't have to step out. And we anointed him with all and we prayed for him. And, and while we was praying, I noticed Brother Don, his voice began to get a little stronger. And he got a little louder. And when he got to where I could understand, he was talking in tongues. God had renewed him in the Holy Ghost. Three days later, a man that was dying, they brought him out of the hospital, they brought him back home, and, and he lived for years, and, and I go and visit with him. And, you know, you promised God that if he just raised you up. Just a few short months ago, he died and went out into eternity, but he was he had backslid again. His sister called and said, would you go pray with him? We went and prayed, and, and I went every day, every day, Brother Zeno, for 27 days, I went straight. And I woke up early that morning, and, and his sister called, and she said, he's just, he's just hanging in there. Could you come and pray? I looked at the clock, it's 3 o'clock in the morning. I'm not telling you all this for a pat on the back, but you better make sure it's a calling from God. Yes. The mantle of the past. <laughs> And I got there and they had him sitting up in a wheelchair because he couldn't breathe laying down. And, and I put my arm around him and he grabbed me around the waist. Ah. And, and I told him, I said, all of this hatred that you've got inside of you, you better let it go. Yes. Let the bitterness leave. I said, you better release all of that because he had a terrible marriage and, and he hated that. Extremely bitter. They had grabbed me around the waist in a wheelchair and I'm praying with him and he's there just repenting oh, and asking God. God to forgive him. Oh, my God. And we probably prayed 30, 40 minutes and, and all of a oh, sudden he will forth and begin to speak in that heavenly language and God renewed him again in the Holy Ghost. And not even a week later, he was gone. That's the mercy of God. Ah. That is the mercy of God. Little guy at Liberty Sporting Goods says, What's your schedule? I said, I don't have one. I said, You want to talk? You just let me and I'll come. And the owner of Liberty said, No, he's about like a doctor. They don't have a schedule. They're on call. I said, Not a sleeping schedule. But the spirit of Cain won't let you do that. It will not. That spirit of Cain it will not. Well, they should have called me within a normal hour. I'm just not going. We've got to make sure that we don't allow that spirit of Cain. Jude mentions Korah, the man who took it upon himself to challenge Moses and the priesthood. My God. God judged Korah and his whole family by having the earth to swallow them up. Because they refused to be obedient. Once again, this spirit is of one who would like to take the anointing of God upon themselves for selfish reasons rather than allowing God to choose his servants. You see, God wants people who are servants to others. 
That's right. He Amen. taught us that when he walked into the room with his disciples. The Bible said he got him a bowl, brother Zeno, and he filled that bowl with water from the face of the and he grabbed the towel and, and he went down and fell at Peter, Simon Peter's feet, and, and he was going to wash his feet. And Peter said, Oh, he jumped, oh no, Lord, you, you can't do that. And Jesus said, If I don't wash your feet, you'll never have a part. No part with me. He was trying to teach his disciples. Get rid of that spirit of Cain and become a servant who is willing. The servant's heart. Who is willing? A minister needs to be concerned with what he can do for the church, not what the church can do for him. Amen. The Chinese have a saying: Wealth rarely survives three generations. That is the truth. The ideal is that someone poor is motivated to make a better life for his family. Amen. Better than what he has. He skimps, he saves, he works hard to get some measure of wealth. His son watches his father work hard and he takes the family fortune and builds upon it to make the wealth even greater. Amen. Don't you know the Rockefellers and, and the Kennedys and Vanderbilt. the Vanderbilts? They, they all started with money. The children did. The third generation, however, grows up never knowing poverty. The third generation feels entitled to the wealth and so they become spoiled. The third generation concentrates on spending the wealth rather than adding to it. Conrad Hilton was born in New Mexico Territory in 1887 to strict Catholic parents. He purchased his first hotel in 1919 and built several others over the next few years. But during the Great Depression, he lost most of his money, My Lord. but bounced back to even greater wealth. In 1944, he founded the Conrad Hilton Foundation to ease human suffering worldwide. Amen. His son, Baron Hilton, pledged to give 97%, at least $2.3 million, of his personal fortune to the foundation that his father started. Anybody ever hear of Paris Hilton? Paris Hilton, the great granddaughter of Conrad Hilton, is known for being an attractive, rich socialite. Amen. She's famous in large parts for being famous. That's true. That's her only accolade. She's famous and yet not. Wow. When someone grows up with wealth, they become accustomed to it. As humans, we make the mistake of believing that something that existed all our lives will always exist. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it don't. That's not true. It doesn't. We stop cherishing and nurturing it and we start neglecting it instead. We feel that we are entitled. My God. Yeah. I'm a fourth generation Pentecostal. I thank God for that heritage. Amen. I had a grandmother. I never knew her. She died at 38 years of age. I wasn't even born. That was just a good old religious girl. Words of my mom. She was invited. Anybody ever heard of a tent meeting or a brush arbor? Yeah. Yes. Amen. I she was invited to one of those services by some of her schoolmates. And she went. And God got all over her life. Filled her with the Holy Ghost. She was baptized in Jesus' name. Went back home and told Mama and Daddy they told her she would never guard the door of a Pentecostal church again. My Lord. If she did, they would put her out. And at 16 years of age, my grandmother was put on the street and told not to come back. Oh, God. Thank God my great grandparents took her in. That's the truth. 
And they finished raising her until she was 18. But they never tried to stop her from pursuing God. That's the truth. But my grandparents, my great grandparents, so that was her, my great great grandparents that took her in. But she made up her mind. I'm going to be obedient to God. Yes, sir. Rather than man. The Bible says if I'm a man pleaser, then I'm not a pleaser of God. Somewhere in every one of our journeys and our walk with God, we have to reach a place where we, our desire to please God is greater than pleasing our friends, pleasing our family. Because if I'm a man pleaser, then I cannot be a God pleaser. Turn to Judges 18 and 30. And the children of Dan set up the graven image. And Jonathan the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh, he and his sons were priests to the tribe of Dan until the day of the captivity of the land. Verse 31. And they set them up, Micah's graven image, which he made all the time that the house of God was in Shiloh. Three generations of Moses. The word Manasseh is written in the Hebrew as Yims. <coughs> M-N-S-H. As you can see, the letter N is written as a sub superscript or subscript above the other letters. Many scholars believe that this was done because the word is actually Jonathan, the son of Gershom, son of Moses. Yes, sir. Now the Hebrew spelling of Moses is M-S-H. We spell it M-O-S-E-S. But the Hebrew spelling is just simply M-S-H. That the writers have given us a clue to say that this is actually the grandson of Moses. But in order to preserve his good name, they pronounce it Manasseh. In three generations, the family went from the strongest spokesman for God yes, sir. to a priest in front of graven images. My Lord. In three generations. I'm the poor. And I'm only the poor because I had a mom that made up her mind. Right. I'm going to be obedient no to God. No matter what. I had a grandmother that went to an old brush over meeting and God got a hold of her. And filled her with the Holy Ghost. And when mom and dad said, you can't go back there anymore. And I want you to know our family lineage, I've got, I go back, I trace it all the way back into the 1700s. Like I said, all of our people came from West Virginia. They were either Baptist preachers or uh, school teachers. And there was a bunch of them that was hung. They were just purely outlaws. So I have a wide spectrum I could have went from. That's right. But because I had a mama that made up her mind, and a grandma that made up her mind, I'm going to be obedient to God. No matter what happens. That's right. A children are fifth generation. My grandchildren will be sixth generation. And normally by the third generation. Brother Alan Oz preached a message and he said we're only one generation away from extinction. That's right. Because you try to talk to young people today about God, do they want to hear it? No. Nope. They tune you out. No. Oh God, are you to a little guy the other day come up to me and he put his hand up. I thought he was going to hit me. I didn't know why. He said, high five. And he turned around and bumped my hip. 
And he grabbed my hand and put his thumb here. I don't, I don't know what all that was. That's some kind of hands. When he got through with all that, he said, what's happening, dude? <laughs> I was raised in a generation, anybody older than me, but it was only one day I was supposed to go, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. That's extinct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's how you do it. That's true. Why did it become extinct? Because parents quit teaching it. My daddy told me, when you go to school, your teacher is your boss. And until you get back here, your teacher and your bus driver are your boss. Right. I had a daddy that drug me off of the bus at the bus stop. And told the bus driver, put your stop arms out and don't move. And whip me in front of the whole bus. I was so embarrassed. I was dead and dead. I'm embarrassed. He said, good. You embarrassed me when your principal had to call me and told me you got in trouble today. And he said, I told him, go get him out of the classroom and whip him again. And when he gets to the bus stop this season, I will whip him again. He said, and tomorrow those horns will be gone and he'll have wings of an angel. But people say, oh, that, that was terrible. That, I want you to understand something. I was disobedient. <coughs> My God. If you weep, if you whip your I go to our jails and pray with people. I tell them, why did you do this? Well, there ain't no repercussions. They stick me in here for six months. And he said, I got a gym, I got electricity, and, and I've got a weight room to work out. He said, you already saw me when I came in here. I'm all above them. And not afraid of any repercussions. And I see them every week. But the law says if you whip your child, you can go to jail. Yeah, that's what's that what's no, wrong. And that's what the kids will tell you. You hit me, I'm gonna call the cops. That's exactly what they Me too. They say that. Okay, he said his sister works at Head Start. You can't even put him in timeout. Nope. Really? Mm -hmm. You can't tell him timeout. Yes. You, you don't have you don't have a choice. Like I can't say. Sit down. Nope. I have to ask them to sit down. Would you please sit down? Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 I've been driving bus for 28 years. I've been to the office twice. If they do anything on my bus, don't get on my bus unless your mama or your daddy call. That's right. Hey, man. <laughs> well, it should be. Don't you see what disobedience does? Uh -huh. yes. We took prayer out of our schools. Yeah. Look where we are. Yeah. Look where we're at today. Now we've got police officers in our schools right. just trying oh, no. to keep peace and order. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. Disobedience. Yeah. Do you see the... Uh -huh. It's a snowball effect. Yeah. 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 It is. It's true. It's chaos. And we're talking about children and, and, and all of this, but the word of the Lord gives us explicit instructions. Yeah. That's true. And I promise you, God is not concerned about what the law says. You could care less. Many years ago, I was working with the postal service and I was walking down the street and, and delivering mail and a, a father and his 17-year-old son was in the yard and, and he was telling me, go ahead, just touch me and I'll call the law. And he had the phone. And, and so when I went by him, I just grabbed the phone. I said, now go ahead and get it. <laughs> go ahead and get it. And that daddy wore him out, which is exactly what he needed. And the dad said, just hang on to the phone a while, Mr. Melvin. I dropped it in my bag. I kept that phone for almost six weeks. But I never saw that dad and son back out in the yard anymore. I told him, I said, he would just have to call. He would. We're talking about obedience. Three generations of David, when Solomon died, his son Jeroboam took over the kingdom. Sure did. First Kings chapter 12, verse 14, and spake to them after the counsel of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, and I will add to your yoke. 
My father also chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. Verse 16, So when all Israel saw that the king hearkened not unto them, the people answered the king, saying, What portion have we in David? Neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel, now see to thy own house, David. So Israel departed under their tents. After David has spent years uniting the northern and southern kingdoms, yes, sir. Jeroboam destroyed it in just a few days. My God. That's right. All his daddy worked for. Why? Because he was greedy and disobedient. <laughs> He did see himself as a servant of the people, but instead saw the people as his servants. The people were a source of tax revenue and nothing more. He felt entitled to the power of being king, but he did not value the effort it took to get there. Tell the pastor. As I mentioned before, the word K means acquisition or greed. The spirit of Cain is a spirit of entitlement. I'm old, sis. My granddaughter the other day told her mom, she said, I'm taking off Friday. I'm entitled to that. I deserve that, Cain. I said, you deserve it? Oh, yeah. That's the spirit of Cain. I deserve a day off. I'm going to take a personal day and I'm going to just go and shop and enjoy myself. We live in a society that thinks like that. There's a young man I know, he, and he's only maybe 19, and he just bought this big old $70,000, $80,000 pickup truck. I mean, it's, it's a king ranch, and it's maxed out sunroofs. And I said, man, how did you afford that? He said, it's the American dream. <laughs> and he said, I deserve that. That's Cain. I'm just waiting, Brother Paul. I know I'm going to see him again. And when I see him, I'm going to say, Did your payment book ever show up? <laughs> what you know? Because that truck won't smell as good as it used to smell. It won't drive as good as it used to. John, because he's probably paying seven, eight hundred dollars, maybe more a month on that truck. Paying through the nose for it. It's over seventy thousand dollars. He's nineteen. Okay, he said the insurance is probably five or six hundred a month. It's a tax. But he said, I deserve that. <laughs> I'm just waiting to see him again. Ask him if he feels like he deserves, still deserves. I saw his dad. His dad said, I tried my hardest to talk him out of it because he's not financially able to meet those kind of notes. I said, What did he tell you? He said, Well, I'm going to drive it until they come pick it up. I'm going to enjoy it. That's the spirit of Cain. Genesis 4 and 5 says, But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very raw and his countenance fell. Cain made an arrogant offering to God and expected that God would consider it. My Lord. Just as Adam and Eve had always done, he figured that any old offering was good enough. But God felt otherwise. Cain was interested in what he was going to get from God, not with what he could give to God. My Lord. Do you ever just stop sometime and listen to yourself pray? Selfish prayers. Give me, Lord. I want this God I want that God and give it to me God I deserve it God I 
It all becomes self-centered. We act like God is our sugar daddy. That's true. Santa Claus. That's right. Lord Jesus. As ministers, we're constantly fighting against our flesh in this regard. That is why the only minister you should follow is one who tells you not to follow him, but follow God. That's right. That's right. Follow Christ. Follow God. That's it. I first received the Holy Ghost. My pastor, I went to him and I said, I want you to, if you see me doing anything, I want you to tell me. I've had some of you come and do the same thing with me. But my pastor, there was an old elder in our church that had been living for God over 60 years. He grabbed me by the hand and he said, come on. And we walked over to old brother Marshall Swain. He said, you see this man? You live for God like he lives for God. Yeah. He said, you'll be okay. Brother Swain probably didn't really like that. Because I came a worry one. <laughs> Brother Kane, Brother Swain, why are you always here at church an hour early? Praying. Mm -hmm. They cut the lights out and we pass by here and an hour later you're still here. He's the last mm -hmm. He said, that's what I promised God I would do, son. He said, I can't have God bless me all the time. I gotta bless him. Yes. Right. Gotta bless him back. And that stuck in my head. I said, Lord, let me be a prayer warrior like Brother Swain. Oh, he became my mentor. They came to visit us one Sunday. Mom said, y'all come on in. Dinner's ready. Y'all just come on in and, and sit out at the table. And he said, thank you, sis. I'm going to sit out here on the porch and just talk with God. What it was, he was fasting on Sunday. <laughs> we don't never have a problem on Sunday, this. You miss one of the six days, you can always grab a Sunday when Sunday's not never taken. And I've never asked you to fast on that Sunday. Because God said, continue what you will do. And I will bless it. Cain made it that arrogant offering, knowing that it was supposed to be blood. My God. Knowing what his mom and dad had taught him. Yes, yes, yes. He feared any old offering was good enough, but God felt otherwise. That's right. Amen. Cain was interested in what he was going to get from God. Yes, sir. In 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 2, and I've got to quit. Elijah said unto Elisha, uh -huh. Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent yes, me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as my soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. Why was Elisha so gung ho not to let Elisha, Elijah get out of his sight? He wanted his man. Because he had asked him, I want a double portion of what you want. I want your man. I don't want just what you got, I want twice a double portion of your man. And Elijah said, if you see me when God takes me, it will be done yes. another portion. Amen. So Elisha said, he'll never be out of my sight. So they went to a town where the sons of the He's prophets were. And like they said, so you just stay here with us. He said, no way. No way. We've got to make up our mind. Whatever it takes, God. Amen. Whatever it is. I'm going to be obedient. Yes. And we're going to close. I'm going to stick to you like blue cheese. Real quickly, I'll, I'm going to just take five minutes. I need to, as soon as we're finished, I need to see Sister Ollie and Sister Mildred, and I need to see Sister Geneva and Brother Bobby. I need to, Sister Victoria's not here, a car broke down in Latvia. Oh. Brother Paul, Brother Dunn, Brother Sister Zeno, uh, Sister Helen and Sister Daisy, and Brother Roger and Sister Annette, and just, just five minutes all I need. But God bless you for being here tonight. <coughs>
don't allow the spirit of Cain to get a hold of you. I heard something one time, and it's still with me today. John F. Kennedy made a statement. Yes. Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. I heard that one time, and it just stuck stuck in me forever. Tonight, don't ask what the church can do for you, but what can I do for God? Push off. The enlistment lines are open. Amen. And we need the soul of the best. David. It's so good to have y'all here. Yes. Yes. Amen. It is so good. John, it is so good. Hallelujah. I had to make up my mind. If you wasn't here tonight, I was going to find out where you live. I was going looking for you. <laughs> they call me blood. Because <laughs> I'm going to find you one way or the other. Amen. It's real fun. Please, let's, let's stand. All right. Soon as we dismiss.